Thank you so much, Michael, for that lovely introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Kyle Lushavu, and uh, like you said, I'm the Programs and Communications Director at Kandimon. Welcome to our Mentorship Lab reading. Um, if you're not familiar with Kandimon, we are a national nonprofit dedicated to nurturing Asian American literature through workshops, readings, Wikipedia edit-a-thons, and our annual retreat, we seek to uplift the storytellers of our community and create a space for writers and readers alike. We have new programs coming out this spring, so please feel free to follow us on social media or go to our website to learn more. So we're on social media at Kandimon Forever and online at Kandimon.org, and I can drop those in the chat later. Um, Thank you so much for being here to support this program. Uh, we also wanna thank the Jerome Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the NEA, and all of our individual donors whose generosity made this program possible. And of course, we want to thank Books Are Magic for hosting us for the second year in a row for this program. So this is our second year of the Mentorship Lab, which we see as a space of close collaboration and community guidance, and it supports nine New York City-based emerging writers. Each of our mentorship fellows here engaged in craft classes across all three genres of poetry, fiction, and creative nonfiction, as well as bi-monthly workshops inside their genre and one-on-one -on -one mentorship sessions with their mentors. Though our program was confined to a virtual setting this year, each of them brought their full creative, engaged, and caring selves to this work, and we're really grateful for that. It was certainly a tumultuous year, but our bi-monthly gatherings were a true light for all of us. This is our final event as a mentorship lab together this year, so I'm really thrilled to be here tonight celebrating their amazing work. You will be hearing from each of our mentors and each of our fellows tonight, so I will begin by introducing one of our mentors. Gina Apostol, her fourth novel, Insurrecto, was a finalist for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, long listed for the Dublin IMPAC Prize, and named by Publishers Weekly one of the 10 best books of 2018. Her third book, The Gun Dealer's Daughter, won the 2013 Penn Open Book Award and was shortlisted for the William Sarion International Prize. Her first two novels, Bibliolepsy and The Revolution According to Raimundo Mata, both won the Juan Laya Prize for the novel, Philippine National Book Award. Her essays and stories have appeared in the New York Times, Los Angeles Review of Books, Foreign Policy, Gettysburg Review, Massachusetts Review, and others. She lives in New York City and Western Massachusetts and grew up in Tacloban, Philippines. She teaches at the Fieldston School in New York City. The New York Times recently called Gina a, ma a marvelous welter of Filipino storytelling. In a citation for her Penn Open Book Award, the judges said, not only does this novel make an argument for social revolution, it makes an argument for the role of literature in revolution. The argument being that liter literature can be revolution. Gina served as faculty in the first year that our Kundiman retreat offered fiction, so we loved having her here as part of this program. And her lessons on history and trauma and crafting point of view were both energetic and essential. A warm welcome to Gina and the Fiction Fellows. Thank you so much, uh, Kyle, and thank you so much, Kundiman, and Books Are Magic. It is a huge pleasure to be here. I know our time is limited, so I'm just going to go directly to the reading from my novel. I will speak to, about the three mentees, that, which is really why, why I'm here. Um, so I'm reading from The Revolution According to Raimundo Mata, which was recently, uh, the US edition was recently published uh, just a few weeks ago, <laughs> January 12. So it's out. Editor's preface. <clears throat> I had not read General Mata's journals when I spoke last year to a Murkian psychoanalyst about the possibility of hysterical abreactions occurring on a national scale. This was during a lull at a conference at a floating restaurant on Manila Bay. Or was it a fish market in Kowloon? I can't keep those junkets straight. There was a full moon and we could see the marble columns of a colonial building nearby, a monstrous wreck that gave the shantytown around it a nasty glamour. 
the scholar, was an unshaved blonde, the kind one often meets at academic conferences. She was expounding on independence movements as, quote, macroscopic examples of aggressivity in the Annalisan while she fondled some frangipani and picked through the pectorals of a peeking duck. It struck me as she manhandled vertebra and munched on the fronds or vice versa that academic blondes are aggressive bores. To compare our revolution, the crux of our history to some hysterical patient on a hypothetical couch was just icing on her slanderous cake. But what did I have to offer her as evidence of the irreducible reality of our history? I knew no scholar, no text, not even a comic book that spoke of the Philippine War of Independence with, without disturbing solipsism or deeply divided angst. It's a history that invites neurotics to speak up. It's no great surprise that it, that it ends up a vulgar patient in obscure Neo-Freudian journals. So that's part of the editor's preface. She's a little bit, a little bit much. Um, addendum, Dr. Diwata Drake's inspiring defense. First of all, I'm not blonde. Yes, I read the Finnish Peruvian philosopher retired to the jeweled coasts of Provence, Claro Mork, guilty. I would wish that crime on my enemies However, more pertinently, I am an American of mixed heritage, a Midwestern mongrel, but I'm Filipino on my mother's side. Okay, half Filipino on my maternal grandmother's side, but the Viking ancestors in my father's Milwaukee line might add Eskimo, so there. Blondness is only a pharmaceutical advantage in my family, a pharmaceutical indulgence. In other words, and I never confessed this to anyone but my first love, who then promptly abandoned me, I'm a bottle blonde, Clairol spun gold number 34, that I have a nervous disposition I will allow. As Mork says, and I paraphrase, to each llama his own symptom. My papers on the psychoanalysis of the Filipino independence movement are no accident as my own analyst has betrayed to me. The seed was my experience in the Wisconsin public schools. I wanted so much to be part of their group. The dairy damaged cretins who pulled at my brunette braids and once hung me from the gym rafters in a rug while singing the theme song from Fiddler on the Roof. I'm not Jewish, I kept saying, but I was in a rug and they couldn't hear me. So that's from that novel, uh, Raimundo Mata. It's about, it's set during the time of the Philippine war against Spain and America. But really, it's my huge pleasure to introduce the three fiction mentees and to hear them share their work tonight. I will say as a mentor, as a so-called mentor of these writers, I can't say enough how much I was mentored as well. I will not only mention here Sarah's uncanny and preternatural poise on Zoom, the way her very direct look at the camera made all of us sit up straight, even CJ is clearly not straight and listen to extremely precise readings of psychoanalytic gaps in a narrative. And I won't tell you only about Yasmin's tender and gentle, but actually also quite scythe-like, <laughs> knife incision-like questions of her peers' choices and her soft, modulated, inclusive, and loving voice. And I will not go on and on and on about CJ's perky inquisitiveness and genuine love for his fellow mentees and his critiques, even as his own stories savaged and mutilated the psyches of everyone around the story. I will only tell you that the affection and engagement and respect, but also sheer intellectual power was palpable every night we workshopped. It was a joy and a learning and a privilege to be with these three writers throughout this lab or as Filipinos pronounced love, lab. The lab we all felt in the room was a gift. So I will introduce them. CJ Diego is a Filipino-American writer and baker. He is a Kundiman Fiction Fellow, a Kundiman Mentorship Lab Fellow, and a Tin House Scholar. His stories have appeared in McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, Electric Lit, and Kartika Review, and have been supported by Crit and Lighthouse Works. A graduate of Cornell, he now lives in Brooklyn, 
where he is at work on novels about social media influencers, gay escorts, and Asian fetishes. He hopes to one day open up a sugar-free bakery in honor of his diabetic mother. Yasmin Adel Majid has received fellowships and support from Kundiman, Kweli, and the Fine Arts Work Center. Her writing has appeared in or is forthcoming from the New York Review of Books, Daily, the Asian American Literary Review, and Another Gaze. She's an editor for The Margins, the literary magazine of the Asian American Writers Workshop, where she also serves as shop steward for their union with UAW Local 2110. Yay, unions. Excellent side note, a story Yasmin wrote in our workshop, A Wedding in Multan, was accepted for publication in the next issue of the Asian American Literary Review. Yay. Sarah Wang has written for Bond, The New Republic, N Plus One, Pan America, The Los Angeles Review of Books, Joyland, Catapult, Conjunction, Stonecutter Journal, Semiotext Animal Shelter, The Shanghai Literary Review, Performer Magazine, Musée d'Art Contemporain de Lyon, and The Last Newspaper at the New Museum, among other publications. She is a Tin House Scholar, the winner of a Nelson Algren Prize for Fiction and a fellow at the Center for Fiction. In 2019, she was a fellow at the Asian American Writers Workshops Witness Program, which bridges conversations about mass incarceration and migrant detention. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, our fiction mentees. Am I on? Can you guys hear me? <clears throat> okay. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I just want to say how incredibly privileged I feel to have been um, a fellow in Kundiman's mentorship program last year. Um, it was, I looked forward every week to seeing everyone and um, in the larger cohort and also my fiction fellows. It was um, as Kyle said, a kind of light, a beacon in um, the dark year of our pandemic 2020. But I'm happy to be here with everyone again. And um, I'm just going to read a short excerpt from my novel. My grandfather had a radio show in Taiwan where people would call in to talk about what was troubling them. From lost loves to filial demands, diminished crop yield and civic responsibility, the nightly show could be heard throughout Taoyuan. He addressed his caller's anxieties and fears with the same gentle consideration as he did with his students at the university where he taught philosophy. At home, my mother said he never talked to her, was impatient and reticent, would scatter uncooked rice on the hard floor and push her down to kneeling when he accused her of misbehaving. The one time she reached over him at the dinner table, he wrapped her knuckles with his chopsticks so hard that the bones in her hand fractured. That's child abuse, I said angrily to my mother. Not for Chinese people. I'm lucky I wasn't a boy. I would have gotten lashed with a bamboo cane, she replied. This disparity had always confused me the same act in two countries. If America, child abuse, assault in the third degree, a class A misdemeanor. If China, convention. I applied this problematic to my potty training. My mother had potty trained me at six months to save money on diapers. In the pediatrician's office, a concerned mother of triplets pointed to me. You forgot to put a diaper on your baby, she exclaimed. She doesn't need a diaper. She's potty trained. My mother smiled with satisfaction. Immediately, the other mothers looked around the room at each other and tittered. This woman is delusional, they thought. Potty training a baby? Out of her mind. This was an origin story for me, being potty trained at six months. As a toddler, I had thought of myself as somewhat of a genius. My peers sitting on fresh loads of wet caca while fighting over blocks. And then there was me with my svelte posterior, sans diaper. 
My psychoanalyst, however, attributed my early potty training, forced control over motor skills when an infant's body hadn't yet developed to a panoply of my issues, both developmental and interpersonal, thus reframing my genius narrative into a trauma. Further complicating the competing narrative strains was my own research in adulthood. It was common for babies to be potty trained at exactly six months in China and India. In America, developmental trauma. In China, good parenting. According to this paradigm, I was clearly born in the wrong country. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll go ahead. Hi, all. Um, I just want to say briefly how much it has meant to me to have been a part of the mentorship lab this past year to get to work with Gina, who's been such a generous and hilarious and wise mentor, um, and to be working with everyone in this cohort. I know that everyone here is a writer whose work that I'll get to read for the rest of my life. And I think even though we're coming to a close together, that's something I'm really looking forward to and grateful for. So I'm gonna read from a short story I wrote while in the lab. Um, it's set in uh, Pakistan under martial law for the second time and is about complicity and state violence and the choices that one has to accept or reject that. So I'll begin. There he was on TV, the new president defending the plan to hang the old one. He was seated in his garden wearing his general suit. The color is dark as the palms behind him. Gathered around the TV set with her family, Samia thought the president's garden looked just like theirs. From where she sat, her father and mother on the divan, Aisha, her sister by the window, and Samia on the old cane stool beside them. She could look out at the palms heavy from spring rain, the stone courtyard with its resident stray cats, and the thicket of sickle-leaf eucalyptus that bordered the house. That bulwark of trees was part of the same batch of saplings her father had imported and planted at their farm in Multan, the year that she was born. They outgrew her quickly, and now, almost nine years later, some of the trees caressed the roof of their home, while Samia remained the runt of the family. On screen, the new president raised his finger to make a point. I may not have given anything at all to this country, but certainly I've given one thing, he said. I've given them rule of law. He was nearly two years into the dictatorship. His suit was garnished with silver ornaments that looked like dull trinkets on TV. They were nothing like the jewelry that Aisha wore to parties, earrings that dripped to her shoulders, gold necklaces that shone with a violent glint, glass trudia that you could snap into crude weapons with the slightest pressure. Samia was drawn to the baubles that girls wore. She described them in detail in stories she wrote with her best friend, Noreen, Mysteries based on British novels they loved about children in the countryside who solved minor crimes. The specifics of their evils were always vague, but the villains were unsettled figures. Men with shifty eyes and skinny throats pocked with stubble, whose plots were always uncovered by the children. Noreen would be visiting soon. In anticipation, Samia had been nurturing the seed of a new story they could write. One that was just about two girls, orphans who only had each other, forced out of their homes with no money, no parents. All that was left was the villain. His character, and they were always men, she knew that at least, was still uncertain. Are you feeling any regret about the sentencing? Asked the interviewer. The new president answered without pause. Frankly speaking, he said, I'm not. Smuggler, thief, petty avenger. Samia was weighing the possibilities for her villain when her father shut the TV off and smiled broadly at his family. Well, he said, Every day, I like him more and more. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me and that my internet does not lag. So I always tell people how much I absolutely love Kudiman. Gina knows this, but I read Raimundo Mata almost 10 years ago. And to this day, I continue to say that her book gave me permission to be weird and wild and experimental. Working with her and the rest of the cohort and the other mentors has saved my sanity and my life. This fellowship made me fall in love with language all over again. You know, eager 
to be funny and clever and silly and raunchy with my sentences and eager to see what the future of Asian American literature can and will look like. So for that, I am eternally grateful. Tonight, I'm going to read the opening of a new short story titled Natural Causes about a chubby Asian guy who dates a white guy who dreams of becoming a world famous ventriloquist. Natural causes. Rex loved Corey, which is why he endured Corey's puppet, Norman. Norman was named after nothing, just a name Corey came up with. When Corey was 22 and jobless, the only things on his resume, freelance babysitter and a degree from Cornell's agriculture school, Corey had purchased Norman from a bald Serbian woman who owned a thrift store in Poughkeepsie. The store was in her apartment, or more aptly, it was her apartment. Even the bathroom contained seaweed enemas and first edition Pokemon cards. Corey nearly settled on what the Serbian woman promised was an authentic gold pendant from a Creole riverboat pirate who'd rescued an albino Swedish clarinetist from the Japanese Yakuza back in the mid 1800s. But there were no papers that could authenticate this story, which is how Corey happened upon the ethnically ambiguous puppet sitting on a rocking chair that farted each time Corey rocked it. The Serbian woman said the puppet was cursed, but the curse was benevolent since each of its previous three owners died of natural causes. A heart attack, an aneurysm, a murder-suicide during spring break in Turks and Caicos. The last death was deemed natural because the college student did not die from the bullet wound, but rather by choking on a piece of pistachio lodged in his throat while his chest bled. The curse's benevolence was enough for Corey to dish out $80 and a thank you to the Serbian woman who led him out of her apartment with a phrase in her native tongue. Corey could not understand her, but she smiled when she finished, which meant she probably said something kind. Rex was more practical. He used the budget app. He had a master's degree in education, which allowed him to teach AP literature at a private school in Park Slope. He snuck gummy bears and Dasani water into movie theaters. He took cold showers every morning and sometimes at night when his dandruff flaked onto his dinner plate. He said he liked Corey's puppet, even though the puppet appeared in his nightmares. Rex liked Corey's penis, its bulbous head, its heaviness in his hand. So he kissed Corey goodnight every night before bed, then said, Good night, Norman, to Norman, who sat on the windowsill, watching their sleeping bodies like a security camera. Thank you. Wow, I'm having so much fun already. Thank you all for those readings. Those are just amazing and I'm loving all the love in the chat. So keep it going. <laughs> um, next, I am excited to introduce uh, one of our poetry members, poetry mentors, Hala Alian. Hala is a Palestinian American writer and clinical psychologist whose work has appeared in the New York Times, Guernica, and elsewhere. Her poetry collections have won the Arab American Book Award and the Crab Orchard series. Her debut novel, Salt Houses, was published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt in 2017 and was the winner of the Arab American Book Award and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Her newest po poetry collection, The 29th Year, was recently published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt and her second novel, The Arsonist City, is forthcoming by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt in March. I have already pre-ordered it and you should too. Um, in a recent starred review, Publishers Weekly said Alian's debut was striking and this one's even better. Hala has been such a generous and kind partner throughout the Mentorship Lab and her multi-genre deafness and talent is truly a wonder. Her lessons were multifaceted and healing with found poetry getting us out of our heads and a lesson on accessing familial and ancestral memories, having us look inward 
all the while guiding us with how to nurture ourselves and our writing. Thank you, Hala, and welcome. Thank you so much. Hi, friends. This is so exciting. Um, I'm going to read a, a quick piece, I mean, three minutes, quickish piece, so that we can get to the real stars of the show. This is called, When They Say Pledge Allegiance, I Say. When they say pledge allegiance, I say, my country is a ghost, a mouth trying to say sorry, and it comes out all smoke, all citizen and bullet and seed. My country is a machine, a spell of bad weather, a feather lacing my mother's black hair. I mean, her dyed hair. I mean, her blonde hair. I mean, her hair matches my country, so shiny and borrowed and painted over. My country is a number, like, it is 1948 and my great-great-grandmother flattens bread with her hands while my other great-great-grandmother prays with her hands. One watches her land disappear. The other builds a house on land that will disappear. My country is an airport line, a year of highways, an intermission. My country is Stockholm syndrome, is immigrant mouth saying thank you, saying please, saying my country is no country but ghost. My country is no man but ghost. My country is dead. My country is named the dead. Give them their letters, give them their salt. My country is a mouth trying to say pledge and it comes out all salt. My country is a mouth and nobody can pronounce my name. I mean, my country forgets my name. I mean, my country is always asking for my name and I'm always saying it twice, spelling it like an address. My country is a country, my, my country is a number like it is 1967 and every Arab leader is crying. Every mother is clutching the son she has left, and my great-grandmother names my mother nostalgia, while my great-grandfather names my father a gun. My country is all ghost. My grandmother is all ghost. My grandmother is a country. I mean, my grandmother is my country. I mean, my country is a lie, is an emptied house, is 1,000 cardboard boxes. My country is, remember when we left Akka? I mean, Gaza. I mean, Homs. My country is the number, like, it is 1990. My mother is crossing a border. I mean desert, I mean life. I'm at her heels. I'm paying attention. I mean, I am learning to pray to a flag. I mean, I am learning English. I mean, I am forgetting Arabic or it is 1994 and I'm falling in love with a white boy. A habit I will never kick or it is 2006 and my grandparents won't evacuate won't leave another war and all summer I dream of floods, collect bullets and love the wrong person or it is 2003 and I am in Beirut watching Baghdad burn because of America. I mean, I am in my country watching my country burn because of my country or it is 2016 and some saw it coming or this 2019 and the women in Beirut are a sea. I mean, my country looks beautiful in red. I mean, I look beautiful in red. I mean, this country likes me in red or it is every year and my country is taken. My country is stolen land. I mean, all my countries are stolen land. I mean, sometimes I am on the wrong side of the stealing. My country is an opening. I mean, bloom. I mean, bloom not like flower, but bloom like explosion. My country is a teacher. I mean, do you want to see my passport? I mean, do you like my accent? I mean, I stole them. I mean, I stole them. I mean, where do you think I learned that from? Right. Let's get to intros. Um, so before I intro T and Aisha specifically, I just wanted to say something about the poetry cohort as a whole, who I had the privilege and pleasure to have workshops with. Um, I don't think it'll surprise anyone to know that this was an extraordinary group of poets whose poetry grabbed my heart during the application stage and it definitely did not let go of it throughout the mentorship program. Each of them brought something truly rare and exceptional to the mentorship, to this workshop space. And I completely agree with what you were saying, Jenna, about I don't know who was mentoring who. What I know was that this program felt really life affirming and changing for me. Um, and I'm so grateful that I got to be part of it. And each of these quote unquote mentees, these poets, just showed up every two weeks with their just full selves in these poems 
from Huang's stunning explorations of ancestral legacy and what it means to be an archaeologist of memory to tease like magical neon-like pieces that always seem to marry these seemingly ordinary everyday details with these like absolutely divine insights to Aisha whose mastery of form and invention led to just ingenious poems and honestly just wonderfully rich discussions about structure and I learned a lot about form that I did not know before. Um, I I've learned a tremendous amount from these three poets and I'm so excited to see what comes next for them. This felt like a gathering of true kinship, both in the smaller um, like poetry workshop and in the larger Kundiman space. It was, it just felt like a space of true deep joy and a, such as people have been saying, such a bright spot of 2020 for me and such a visceral reminder of what we mean when we say poetry is a form of rescue and writing is a form of rescue. And I think when we say that, what we're really saying is witnessing is a form of rescue, both like being witnessed saves you, but then also the act of being called upon to do the witnessing saves you too. Um, so yes, so thank you to T and to Huang and to Aisha for being in the space with me. And thank you to the larger Kundiman Mentorship Program, the other mentors, Kyle, Kathy, and the other brilliant mentees for allowing me to be part of this experience. So I'm going to intro T and then Aisha, and they're going to read in that order. T Tran Lee is a poet based on traditional Karnasi and Munsi Lenape land, otherwise known as Brooklyn a pushcart and best of the net nominee. Their work can be found in Fog, Foglifter, Paji, the Breakwater Review, Quayle Journal, and elsewhere. T has received fellowships from Kundiman and Brooklyn Poets. They live with their spouse and three cats, Piaf, Birdie, and Freddie Mercury, amazing names. For the year 2020, T was among the top 0.1% listeners of Mariah Carey on Spotify. I laughed a lot when I heard that. Okay. And then we got Aisha. Aisha Reyes identifies herself as a hybrid creating um, poetry through hybrid forms. Reyes currently serves as an assistant poetry editor at the Asian American Writers Workshop Margins and has received fellowships from AAWW, Brooklyn Poets and Kundiman from Lahore, Pakistan. Reyes is a graduate of Bennington College and currently lives in New York City. Her first book of poetry, Coining the Wishing Tower won the Broken River Prize hosted by Platypus Press, judged by Kave Akbar, and will be forthcoming in March 22, 2022, which is so exciting and I can't wait to get my copy. Um, please welcome T and Aisha, starting with T. Hi, thank you so much, Kala, for the wonderful introduction. Also want to extend my um, thanks to you in particular, Hala, for um, being such a generous um, and uh, inquisitive mentor uh, in this time. I know we had several conversations where we're like, what's happening? <laughs> um, thank you for taking on um, mentoring three poets during that time. Um, I also want to thank my cohort, um, Aisha and Wei Ying. Y'all are amazing and valuable and wonderful. I'm so glad that I already knew y'all when we came in, and I'm glad to know you even better now. Um, and thank you to the rest of the uh, Kundiman team. Kyle, thank you so much for all of the hard work, um, and Kathy as well, and everyone else um, in the 2020 Mentorship Lab. Um, I am reading something new um it only uses an ex um, the exclamation point as a punctuation um so that i'm less yelling at you i'm going to um note those exclamation points with a clap so let's do this <laughs> um vegetal scape oh here are my hands now a month's worth of mud soil crests my nails like dregs on a rake. The rake is my hand. It does not span wide, just holds an octave. Oh, there's no piano. These hands hold flora, as suggested by Sue, a previous therapist, no less. I'm covered in moss, worm castings, perlite. Oh, eggshell compost tea, the aura of earth, petrichor rising in my bedroom soft, a hazy waltzing 
across parking lots, a Texas minute, oh storm, an urgent sun, the soap turns to steam, buildings are sponges, soggy and leaching, my mouth is rambling to fill the stillness tucked in my stomach, oh, the rigid ache swells, I wake up with it, the hollow carton, thanks for having me, the audacity, taking up this space and to think I have, oh, a secret also, I have not bathed, no, no, not in a month, yes, I bathe monthly, it's just that I hate seeing my body, too vulnerable, oh, imagine naked among the whole world, wrapped in a curtain, yes, my weeping frame, it's such loneliness, eyes closed, I scrub quick, not like my brother, oh, the shower is his, his pavilion, my brother crooning, Puccini Verdi, whole ass arias, oeuvre de l'avant, my brother belting, oh, Bowie's entire catalog circling, young American, over and over, for an hour, yes, my brother in his throat, Carol's absolute, oh, symphony sweeping, oh, lovely Victrola, I just splash and go, my, my, ba my bath is full of, you guessed it, some plants, sweating and careening, oxalis folding, philodendron vines, oh, tritiscantia, peperomia, and velvet algae, frosted across me, a dressed up Eden, the sap and sharp scent of a wounded plant. Oh, bleeding and there go, where fingers borrow, subterranean, they come up for air, the loam slips off me, the sods off my hands. Oh, this earthen ennui, a benediction, an ashen Wednesday, breath, bog, and mire, mire releases, releases like gloves. Thank you so much. Hello, that was incredible, Tiff, and thank you so much, Hala, for your amazing intro. I have similar sentiments that I've been, so um, I have a lot of feelings. So I'm just going to go ahead with my reading. Um, I will be reading two poems this evening, um, and while curating them, I wanted to showcase two ends of one year or two ends of how life could be the spectrum like a really really bad one <laughs> a bad moment and a really like trying good good one so the first poem is obviously the sad one it's an elegy uh, dedicated to my best friend who passed away um, and it can be a bit triggering so if you would like to mute your um, volume for this poem. I will wait five seconds before I begin. And once I start the second poem, I'll wave to the screen. Um, so you guys can come back. So. After for Q. You made buildings out of nothing. Look at the palms on my hands. Do you taste the ash in this fire? The sun hit the curls of both of our heads and you melted. I rolled my skin all day in your wax just to embody your carcass. I can't just write one poem and call it done. I have been isolated, caged, choked, smothered, and my heels laid down in water dust, unforked. Can I end myself in front of you and ask my last words to match your next ones? How would you greet me? Where would you greet me? I hope you greet me. I know, I have always been putting this soul into tough positions. I have righted it out of faith to punish God only to watch him reannounce me. How my bones jolt and how my veins jump. I never enjoyed 4 a.m. discos. Lack of breath, recoils, nailing, unnailing my hands, sucking off the crescents in my palms. I never enjoyed pills, just like you. I want you to remember me like how you wanted me to remember you before you refused to show me your face, before I couldn't show you my face, before I faces were foreign to not just land, but also a stretch. We made something out of asking the silence and hearing the silence back. 
Are you confused of me, of these words, these addresses? I, mean, I made these choices by choice as if choice is, if, is of our own making. When you died, I died. Look, I have no shoulder bone, no vitamin D, no dimple, no skin. I had to bump my buildings and take a flight back to my room where one parent held me down and the other watered me up. Have you ever lived in a second where the half of it was spending, recovering from the rest? I will never want to die as much as I want to. I stand astounded, open-mouthed, lung agape, watching each day wrinkle, spot my skin, sentence me with the task to perceive this mundane into miracle. I'm starting the second poem. Love and self in 10 acts. One, I was walking on the side of the road. It was a hot day, not the type where one picked myself, but the type where one hides through a white rot. As I walked, my head lost all its water. My hair blew up. My hair became wisps. In hover, my hair followed me like a ghost shelter. I wanted to see the back of my head. I turned and turned, but my gaze could not reach it. For a very long time in the summer's heat at the side of the road, road I circled. Two, sometimes one has to sit down with themselves and redefine a terrible thing into a good thing. Sometimes one has to acknowledge that the thing is only meaningful if afforded meaning. Sometimes meaning can simply be taken away. Three, so therefore I have decided. The ghost shelter made up of thirsted this here is an archangel. My archangel is not a human man or woman, but a sexless, genderless, raceless bird. It got wings and a language of tiny tweets and neck shifts. I do not understand it, but I know it is there, perched at the back of my head like a beacon. Four. When I had to wait out my disease, I opened YouTube and watched BTS's Black Swan over and over again until I fainted out of dehydration. Five, a black swan is too romanticized. Art is too romanticized. Suffering is too romanticized. Almost to a degree where self-love is no longer an option for a positive cause, where we believe an artist only has weightage in consequence of suffering. Six, on WhatsApp, my mother calls me prophet. I shake, I shake, I shake, I disco. Seven, on Instagram, I tell all my countries, before you, before I, planet. Eight, when it rains, I salt. I turn my walk to, on the side of the road to a jog, but my hair drinks the water. My ghost gets drunk. My bird ducks, goes silent inside my shirt. Tables have turned. I am now its protector. I find refuge underneath a store's veranda. I don't want to be the only one here. I want a suitor with an umbrella and good company, just like in a drama or a book fed to me when little girl. Nine, now big woman. I spent much of my youth burying my dead friends. The other time in bed watching the internet, swallowing feed, breaking knotted hair. And so here in this hair fall, I found out self-love is allowance for love from other spaces, places, gazes, as much the world's as my own's. 10, soon the rain let up, the heat cooled, sun played peekaboo, angels shifted out and about, tweeting, everyone is not, everything is not a reclaim, but even then I stretched my body carried on, seized the day by its very throat. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, those were beautiful. Next, I will introduce our next poetry mentor, Chingyi Chen. Chingyi Chen is a genderqueer Chinese American hybrid writer, community organizer, and teacher. They're the author of The Heart's Traffic and Recombinant, which is the winner of the 2018 Lambda Literary Award for Transgender Poetry, as well as the chapbooks How to Make Black Paper Sing and Kundimon for Kin, Information Retrieval for Monsters, which was a finalist for the Leslie Scalapino Award. 
Chen is also co-editor of The Revolution Starts at Home, Confronting Intimate Violence Within Activist Communities, and Here is a Pen, an anthology of West Coast Kandiman poets. They have received fellowships from Kandiman, Lambda, Watering Hole, Cancerat, and Imagining America, and are a part of Makondo and Voices of Our Nation's Art Foundation writing communities. A community organizer, they have worked in Asian American communities in San Francisco, Oakland, Riverside, Boston, Milwaukee, and Houston. They are currently an assistant professor in the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences and the MFA in Creative Writing and Poetics at the University of Washington, Bothell. Terence Hayes once said, Chingyi Chen is no ordinary poet. They are in fact many poets at once, a poet of wide ranging forms, a poet of resonant voices, and most significantly, a poet anchored by intensity. Shapely and wild, personal and cultural, cultural, tough and vulnerable, this is a poet and a poetry of steadfast innovation and depth. Chingyi was a fellow at the very first Kandiman retreat and often comes back to work at the Retreat as staff. So it was super special to have them be part of our mentorship lab this year as well. Chingyi led us through such a fun speculative world building exercise where we all collectively designed our post-apocalyptic world that they then led us through a communal writing exercise for. Thank you so much for being part of the group and welcome Chingyi. Thank you so much, Kyle um, and Kathy, for all the work you did to um, gather this space together um, to Books Are Magic. I'm so pleased to be here with uh, all the Kundiman Fellowship Lab Fellows and Mentors. Dear O, I was born, they said, a boy into a heritage of paper. If a fire is placed in a crumbling wall, it leads me to you separated from the screen. I am not here often. The one who arrived, I lost him in the sea. I was born so much missing your eyesight, blooming without birds. My body unfolds in the sound it sings in line. I lost you in the sea. An ideal neighbor, a stone buried below my mother's white grain building. A blue vat dye, burning stones to throw. All my unborn reckless as a lamp, strung as a light, broke a path. There was a boy who was not me because I was a bird singing double-hearted in the floating line by the sea, soft-throated to face down the audience. my repurposed pandemic poem. <laughs> so now um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Wei Ying B. Chan, um, aka Dandelion, who I've had the pleasure of meeting with these last six months. It's been a real joy to have these bright moments to talk poems and legacy and family history and memory. And I've also really enjoyed um, getting to gather with the other um, mentees and mentors um, in, in the uh, Kuniman Mentorship Lab. Uh, Hui Ying is a very thoughtful writer, deeply committed to an exploration of questions of lineage, heritage, community responsibility, as well as a wild experimenter with new diasporic forms and reimaginings of traditional poetic forms. Um, Huang's work is multi-layered and inquisitive, asking critical questions to get to the depths of what is often not spoken. Um, I believe that Huang's writing, which includes a long-time investment in personal, familial, and community oral and speculative histories, is also ghost, seed, water, sunlight, and is what we need to breathe. Um, and then a more official bio. Um, Huang B. Chan is a creative writer, cultural organizer, and facilitator, born and raised in New York City. His body of work explores race, diaspora, intergenerational, and ancestral resilience and love. He works as a researcher for education justice to transform public schools. Um, after hours, he facilitates writing workshops to cultivate radical imagination and healing towards liberation. Huang has received write writing fellowships and awards from the Asian American Writers Workshop, Mona slash Voices and the Poetry Incubator. He fought for a BA in Ethnic Studies and Education from Wellesley College, where he was the first to graduate with an Ethnic Studies major since the college's inception. 
He loves water and does this work for his communities and queer and trans ancestors and descendants to come. So excited to hear your work tonight. Thanks so much, Chingy. Oh my God, I feel so seen um, in the introduction. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm imagining like the whole audience in front of us. And um, I think I wanna just open to say that for a long time, I questioned myself as a writer um, and whether or not like I could or like would or should do it. And incredibly, it's like during the pandemic in the midst of all of these crises that I have like the clarity um, of like our and my power and purpose as writers. And for me, it's to catalyze um, those inner and personal revolutions um, so that we can reach and achieve and dream the societal ones. Um, and so being part of the fellowship helped me get there. And I think for tonight's reading, I would dedicate it to folks in the diaspora um, and for those who are looking to connect back to themselves again and to the parts that you think that you lost. One, in Hoi Ping, after years of dreaming this trip, I finally find the town whose library has the genealogical book with the names of my ancestors. We find my grandmother's father's name on page 1112. Anticipation rises, smile fades, I search, I scan. Grandma's name is missing. We only record the names of sons, the genealogist explains. I flip back generations, fingers set the book in flames. Two. We were historians once. When genealogists trotted door to door, harboring names of sons, we watched. Behind the steam of rose clay lids, sinking sun swept cool cement of our homes, we declared, we will gather history ourselves. So we huddled our daughters, made rounds in villages, asked for names of grandmothers, and what does it feel like in your body to have been raised by your mother? Some women squatted low and hugged themselves like dinosaur eggs burgeoning in earth. Others stood tiptoe like red crowned cranes, tilted heads back and hissed, palms outstretched towards sky. Some women immediately recoiled like rattlesnakes, spines devastated by silence and sobs. Some heard the question smile big like hyenas and cackled lawlessly. We gathered this evidence in our bodies, or rather the evidence gathered us. At the full moon, we huddled shoulder to shoulder and released. Daughters played drums. We stomped powdery red soil, bent bodies into reckonings with time. We shrieked from throats, pumped fists against earth, sprouted backs wide like tree trunks. We bowed to the spirits and prayed. May the way we honor our bodies speak your name. May fortress of our voices venerate your flames. May we love ourselves so deep we thicken roots here in this place. At close of the last drumbeat, our feet sank into damp, dark soil. Young river of tears drenched our souls, returned underground as ancient. Somewhere, the oceans roared and floodgates of memory cracked open. Thank you, that was lovely, Hui. Um, I'm now going to introduce our final mentor. Mayuk Sen is the author of Tastemaker, Seven Immigrant Women Who Revolutionized Food in America, which is forthcoming from W.W. Norton and Company in November. And everyone should also pre-order this. Um, he has won a James Beard Award and an IACP Award for his food writing, and his work has appeared in the Best American Food Writing. He teaches food journalism at New York University. Of his writing, 
Cakeboy Magazine said he's established himself as an excavator of oft ignored stories about queerness and people of color, complicating narratives that have been suffocated by the grip hold of colonialism, homophobia, or death. Mayuk previously taught a food writing intensive for us at Kandiman, and we were thrilled to have him be part of a longer form program with us. His fascinating lessons focused on the dynamics of power inherent in writing about food and how to locate your own story while writing about someone else's. I'm really happy to welcome Mayuk and the Creative Nonfiction Fellows. Thank you so much, Kyle, for that uh, very kind introduction and for reading that uh, Cake Boy magazine profile of me. It's very funny. Um, so real quick before I you know, read an excerpt from my uh, dinky little piece. I just want to say um, I was so honored to even be asked to be um, the creative nonfiction mentor um, for the Mentorship Lab. I, you know, um, I already had high expectations for this program, but um, I think that my experiences really exceeded those high expectations. Um, I was blessed with a wonderful, wonderful cohort whom you'll meet uh, in a few minutes, and um, I'm so grateful to Kyle and to Kathy and everyone else at Kundiman who um, created such a space where there's this very refreshing um, absence of any hierarchy. Um, I think that's very rare um, in writing and teaching spaces. Um, and you know, to echo uh, what some of the other mentors have said, um, my mentees, quote unquote, did not feel like my mentees at all. They were the ones teaching me, yada yada. You know, so I'm really grateful to them and their work. But. Anyway, so um, I'm just going to read um, a very small excerpt from a piece that um, was published last month um, by the Criterion Collection. Um, it is um, something of an obituary, you could call it a eulogy, um, for the great Bengali actor Shumitra Chatterjee, who um, unfortunately passed away in November uh, due to complications from COVID-19. Um, so it feels kind of appropriate after, you know, this year that we've had and the year we're likely about to have to commemorate one of the great artists we've lost to this pandemic. Um, so here's just a chunk from the middle of the piece. Okay. One sec. Okay. As a child in my Bengali speaking home in New Jersey, oceans away from West Bengal, I would associate Shumitra Chatterjee with an entirely different role than the Apu of the great Bengali filmmaker Satyajit Ray's Apu Shanshar. To me, he was always an intrepid private investigator named Pradoshmitter, nicknamed Feluda. Feluda was the subject of a series of thrilling mystery novellas penned by Ray and geared toward children. The director made two film adaptations of these texts starring Jatterjee as Feluda, The Golden Fortress and The Elephant God. Like their origin texts, these entertaining films are totally disparate from Ray's more heralded works targeted towards adults. I devoured these Feluda books with great enthusiasm as a nine-year-old kid, but Faluda himself seemed like a mythic abstraction in my head. On screen, Faluda became a more complex creature than my childhood mind could ever envision. Chatterjee gave this fantasy flesh. The elfin god centers around Faluda, attempting to crack the case of a valuable statue of a deity that's gone missing. And the film distills Chatterjee's magnetism into a few short hours. Look to the scene when Faluda first learns of the case at hand. Chatterjee takes a straightforward clinical line of questioning. Where is the statue from? What's that person's name? and manages to give it motion and moral urgency, revealing what animates Faluda in his quest for justice. He's curious in one moment, reflective the next. Jaji allows his viewer to see each thought turning over in Faluda's head. The performance teams with rich details too. In a later scene, Faluda gets a mid-meal call from a potentially crucial source. He rushes to the phone and listens intently to what the man on the other end of the line is saying. But Jaji stops every few seconds to lick his fingers clean of any food between words. These quirks, gestures that seem so unstudied, belying the deliberate choices Chatterjee made as a performer, are meticulous in their peculiarity, bring a folk hero down to human scale. Such was the sorcery of Chatterjee's partnership with Ray. Ray's writing was brilliant on its own, but Chatterjee interpreted it with a kind of imagination that words can't capture. Even a child's mind has limits compared to the movies. Okay, that's it. Uh, you can read the rest on criteriancollection.com. Uh, so uh, real quick, in the interest of time, I just want to, um, instead of boring you with an effusive spiel about my three, uh, you know, these three brilliant writers I'm about to introduce, um, I'm just going to read their bio straight. Uh, we've got nine minutes or so. Um, so 
First, you're going to hear from Wilson Wong. Uh, Wilson Wong is a writer based in Brooklyn, like myself. Uh, he is a reporter for NBC News, and he is interested in how queerness and family intersect with Chinese and Asian American diaspora. I will add to that straightforward bio that he writes about those topics with such grace and precision, and I'm excited for all of you to be reading him uh, in the years to come. Next up, uh, you'll meet uh, Promethi Islam. Uh, she's a writer and educator based in New York City. The daughter of Bangladeshi immigrants, Promethi learned early on the power of language for community mobilization and in amplifying narratives pushed into the margins. Her writing seeks to uplift the nuanced ways in which we experience the world through culture, diaspora, alienation, and a sense of belonging. So I will just say that she does all of those things that she sets out to do with, you know, uh, real grace and exceptional beauty. Uh, some returns of phrase are just truly really remarkable and saw me dread, dead in my tracks as I was reading. And then finally, after Promethi, you're going to hear from uh, Vesna Haas. Uh, she's a writer and arts administrator based in Carroll Gardens, Brooklyn, by way of Long Beach, California. She's interested in storytelling through written, cinematic, and dance mediums. Her writing explores themes of family and cultural identity rooted in her Cambodian American upbringing and an ongoing effort to define what that means. I will just say that I am truly jealous of Vesna and her ability to write with such clarity and directness and economy. Uh, it's a skill that uh, it's taken, I still don't have, um, and I hope we'll have in a few years, but she's just uh, blessed with it already. So uh, take it away, Wilson. Uh, thank you so much for your, for your generous words. Uh, I remember when all the fellows were publicly announced. I had read everybody's bio on the website, and I remember thinking everybody sounded so incredibly talented and writerly, and spending the past six months with everybody has only confirmed those assumptions and revealed just how thoughtful and compassionate and lucky I was to read such beautiful pieces of work. Um, I'm so grateful for my cohort who spent every other week reading my work, trying to make it legible. Uh, they all believed in my writing before I did, um, and I couldn't have survived this past year without them. Uh, so with that being said, uh, the piece I'm actually reading today started out as one of my youth's writing exercises for one of our workshops. Uh, the essay is called Playthings. I was six the first time I kissed a girl. Her name was Barbie. It was the summer of 2003, and the humidity in Brooklyn made my skin smell sour. My dad took me out for a ride in his burgundy Lincoln Town car, and we drove towards Toys R Us along Shore Parkway, where I could see the oil-marled waters of Gravesend Bay from the passenger seat. The only time my dad allowed me to sit in the front next to him was after he fought with my mom, which was often. After they got into their routine spats, he and I would leave the house together, just the two of us, and let the hum of the car engine assuage his anger. I would often forget their shoutings as I lost myself staring into the swirling vertigo of the polluted bay. Liang Jai, he said once we reached the store, beautiful son, Pick out anything you want, he said. The cold central air tickled my shirt, hunched over the cart with one foot on the bottom ledge and the other propelling me forward. I whirred down aisle after aisle of toys with florid faces. I paused at the girls' section, enamored by the Cinderella Barbie doll, who was exactly like the character I had seen in the Disney movie. I admired her cornflower blue dress and her fair skin and as I stood in front of her, I imagined myself another life. Who could I have been if I was born into a white family? Gone, my unruly head of auburn hair and my pudgy Chinese nose. I told myself I would be satisfied with longer eyelashes or hev heavier eyelids or even hairier legs. Cinderella was the woman I always wanted. When I turned the aisle corner, I caught a fleeting glance of my father speaking to a woman I didn't know. He called me over. This is Joanna, he told me. Call her Auntie Joanna. Joanna had slightly pinched eyes and unnaturally black hair. She tore her gaze away from my father and looked at me. 
Gui Zai, Joanna said, Chinese white boy. What do you want? I buy you anything, she said. My dad wrapped his arm around her body, his hand clutching her waist. A flash of gold, his wedding ring caught the light. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, that was a beautiful lesson. Uh, my name is Pramiti, and I am overwhelmed from hearing from all of the breathtakingly talented writers in our cohort and our mentors. Uh, big thanks to Kundiman family, Kyle, Kathy, Julia, everyone that worked so hard um, to make this experience what it was. And you all helped build a community of learning and love um, in a time of so much uncertainty and upheaval and of loss. And it was profoundly healing for me to be a part of. So thank you for that. Um, and our, our magical quartet, Mayuk, Basnell, Wilson, and myself, um, we really had a lot of fun and we learned so much together. So to be able to share in this sacred space with our loved ones and um, the public tonight is really exciting. And thank you all for you know, having us. So I'm gonna read a short excerpt from a longer piece called Faithful Femmes. And it's a story about true love and queer love and radical joy. I once had a job that largely involved frequent travel to small colleges sprawled across the US during the coldest months of the year. After one such trip, I returned home after having driven through a blizzard whipping through upstate New York and arrived at my Harlem apartment after seven hours, three hours longer than the trip should have taken. As I steered my car into the roundabout in front of the towering building where I lived, I saw my partner, Samira, shivering in the snow, her sleeping bag coat zipped up to her nostrils, her glasses dotted with the perspiration of warm breath and freezing temperatures. She gestured for me to pull over. I did. She opened the car door and I tumbled out as icy snowflakes pierced my skin. Go upstairs, she said. She informed me that she would be returning my car at the rental location nearby, the last of the arduous tasks required from my trek. I mustered up a faint protest, but she was firm. Don't worry, I'll take a cab back, she assured me. In the elevator, I inhaled the stale scent, thinking about the hundreds of riders it carried each day and prayed as I always did, that the elevator would reach my floor smoothly. Candy cane strewn in tinsel, spelling out J-E-S-U-S, -S, welcomed me, hanging from my neighbor's front door as I reached the 20th floor. I always read it, Jesus, in my head. These candy canes had been hanging for the entire three years I had lived in this building and looked even older than that, but the timing had just circled back to be seasonal once again. Music blasted and a cannabinoid fragrance wafted from another neighbor's apartment despite the late hour. But it was a sweet melodied bachata and I liked it and I liked my neighbors, so I never complained. Fumbling to find my keys, I momentarily panicked that I had forgotten them in the one bag I had left behind in the car for Samira to bring back. Subhanallah, I sighed when I found them, surprising myself with Arabic as the language of my relief. My apartment was low lit and smelled very faintly of grapefruit. It had recently been cleaned. I peeled off my layers of outerwear and left my snow boots caked and sludged by the door. On my bamboo kitchen table stood 12 extra long stemmed roses in a dazzling shade of cerise splaying over the edges of a stubby rounded vase. Two tall chilled bottles of my preferred seltzer with mandarin orange flavor notes and a small envelope with my initials written in Samira's curly cued print. I opened it to find a card with felt applique on the front, spelling out, I love you more than Mac loves cheese, and a few lines inside that Samira had written in black pen. My tears dropped into her words, transforming them into a watercolor ink blot and grayscale, permanently muddling the sentences, but not the sentiment. The front door opened and Samira staggered in, shaking out her coat's hood. You left the keys in the front door, she said, barely masking her annoyance, though she softened when she saw my face, eyes bloodshot, dragon red. I kissed her hand. I haven't even washed up yet, she laughed, drawing me to embrace. 
Somehow, despite having just been outside, her chest felt warm. I lowered my forehead against it and said, I don't mind. And that story would have a very different ending if it had taken place in the last 12 months, probably with her washing her hands, singing happy birthday two times. Thank you all. I believe it's a uh, Vesna's turn to uh, read, correct? Are you ready to read, Vesna? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, great, go ahead. Okay, well, thank you to everyone who's still tuned in. Um, I really appreciate you hanging in here. Um, and I just wanna say, you know, echoing everything uh, all of my peers have said, this has been an incredible experience and shout out in particular to Promiti and Wilson, um, my fellow creative nonfiction uh, cohort. Um, uh, you know, we we're all writing about our families and peers and, and our feelings, and that's not an easy thing to do, um, but we really uh, were re able to create this space of trust that was so important, and we wouldn't have been able to do that without Mayuk as our mentor, so just thank you for all of that. Um, and I'm about to read uh, an excerpt from a piece called Picture Perfect. Uh, it's about love. My parents rarely ever spoke to their children about love. When we were teens, they told us that we had no business worrying about it and were expressly forbidden from dating. What was most important they preached was that we focus on schoolwork so we could go to college and land solid careers. Only then would we be free to look for that significant other and we'd have no problem finding them, they'd say. With no real guide of what to expect in love and relationships, I turned instead to what I saw unfolding in front of me on TV. I spent a large chunk of my childhood summer days glued to the static of our Magnavox television set, watching as morning cartoons morphed into the local news broadcast, then talk shows, daytime soap operas, and classic reruns before the evening news rounded out the day. Soap operas taught me how to follow layered plot lines filled with characters who seemed to never really die, meaning they had multiple lifetimes to fall in and out of love with anyone and everyone around them. I bought into these examples of love and partnership that played in front of me on television and knew that I wanted to get married one day. I didn't dream of a picture perfect wedding, but I had the hopes of a hopeless romantic wanting to meet someone while riding the train or while reaching for the same book at a used bookstore, scenarios only fit for the screen. Of these soap operas, ABC's General Hospital kept me the most riveted as I followed the roller coaster of a relationship of Sonny and Carly Corinthos. Sonny was a brooding mob boss whose business dealings made for precarious entanglements for his wife, Carly, who was frequently abducted and held hostage by men holding grudges against her husband. This resulted in many passionate rescue efforts and reunions. Over the span of 16 years on screen, Sonny and Carly had have been shot or stabbed, cheated on and been the cheater countless times. They've also been married to each other four times. I could not look away as I watched them fight over misunderstandings and former lovers and then reconcile time and time again. This must be love, I thought, dramatic, expressive, and always salvageable in the end, no matter what the obstacle. Thanks. <laughs>